In the following video, we present a laparoscopic approach to trachelectomy. The authors have no relevant disclosures. A supracervical approach is undertaken in about 10% of all hysterectomies. A supracervical approach may be favored in a variety of situations. Some examples are to lower the risk of bladder injury in the setting of severe bladder adhesions, at the time of unplanned hysterectomy for a postpartum hemorrhage, or patient preference. However, about 25% of patients who undergo supracervical hysterectomy will continue to have bothersome symptoms, and many of these women will go on to have a trachelectomy. Studies have not demonstrated a difference in complication rate between supracervical or total hysterectomy. Overall, the benefits of supracervical hysterectomy remain largely theoretical. However, some women will still choose preservation of the cervix. Many of these women hold the belief that sexual function and satisfaction will be negatively affected if the cervix is removed. However, this is not demonstrated in the literature. Patients should be counseled that the best predictor of post-operative sexual function is a patient's pre-operative sexual function. Trachelectomy for patients who have previously undergone a hysterectomy involves the five following steps. Step one, restore anatomy. Depending on medical and surgical history, there may be adhesions of small or large bowel, rectum, bladder, or adnexa to the cervix. Adhesiolysis and restoration of anatomy must be performed initially for visualization of the cervix. Step two, create a bladder flap. Step three, perform anterior and posterior colpotomy. Step four, lateralize the uterine artery pedicles. The colpotomy can then be completed. And step five, close the vaginal cuff. In this video, we present the case of a 50-year-old G4P2 woman who is otherwise healthy. She underwent hysterectomy for issues of heavy menstrual bleeding and dyspareunia. She preferred a supracervical approach for personal reasons. Unfortunately, her dyspareunia persisted and five years later, she decided to proceed with trachelectomy. Step one, restore anatomy. A survey of the pelvis is performed. Fortunately, despite our patient's previous surgeries, there are no adhesions of any structures to the cervix in this case. The ureters are visualized transperitoneally and are far from our site for colpotomy, and ureterolysis is not necessary in this case. A sponge stick is placed in the vagina to delineate the cervix. Step two, create a bladder flap. The vesicovaginal space is developed and the bladder should be deflected inferiorly about two centimeters from the site of planned colpotomy. Here, once we know the bladder is not overlying the cervix, the internal os is perforated with a dilator. Then a uterine manipulator with a cervical cup is placed. By using the intrauterine tip, we ensure a snug fit of the cervical cup so the cervix will be removed entirely while maintaining vaginal length. Here we can see the cervix well delineated and the inferior margin of the bladder that needs to be further mobilized to facilitate the anterior colpotomy. Both blunt and sharp dissection are used to further deflect the bladder off of the pubocervical fascia until the site for colpotomy is clear. Step three, anterior and posterior colpotomy. The monopolar hook is used to perform the anterior and posterior colpotomy. By performing this step first, the location of the uterine vessels is well delineated. Step four, lateralize the uterine artery pedicles. Since the anterior and posterior colpotomies have already been performed, we now only need to lateralize the uterine artery pedicles as far as necessary to complete the colpotomy. The bipolar vessel sealing device is used to desiccate and lateralize the uterine artery pedicle and the colpotomy is then completed. This is performed bilaterally. The cervix is removed vaginally. Suction irrigation is performed and bleeding of the vaginal cuff is addressed. 
we try to use as little energy as possible. Step five, close the vaginal cuff. We close the vaginal cuff with a barbed suture in a running unlocked fashion for good anatomic and hemostatic effect. The patient was discharged home the same day and her recovery was unremarkable. Her dyspareunia improved following surgery. Pathology confirmed benign cervical tissue. Trachelectomy is sometimes considered an intimidating procedure. Our case helps to demonstrate that trachelectomy is potentially within the scope of any practitioner performing total laparoscopic hysterectomies. Although this case demonstrates a simple and straightforward trachelectomy, these same steps can be applied to more complex cases as well. In summary, trachelectomy following a previous hysterectomy is performed with five basic steps. One, restore anatomy. Two, create a bladder flap. Three, perform anterior and posterior colpotomy. Four, lateralize the uterine artery pedicles. The colpotomy can then be completed. Five, close the vaginal cuff.